All right, this morning, interesting guy, I got a text this morning from uh, uh, Sonny about the uh, upcoming leadership meeting they have for their conference every year. Uh, I thought what was interesting in it was that it was going to be called uh, Preparing for Revival. And it kind of went along with what I'm going to be talking about this morning. Uh, you know, we have a in our bulletin and on the sign outside, we have a, a mission statement or a vision statement which says, knowing God and making him known. And although no one probably reads their bulletins, unfortunately, but it is in the bulletin. But it, it basically explains everything that we're about. You know, for us personally and as individual believers, growing and uh, becoming more acquainted and developing our, our intimacy with the Lord. And then the other part of that being making him known to others, which would be evangelism in all its different forms. You know, some people are called to street evangelism. Some people are called to, uh, you know, knock on doors. Uh, most of us probably are more relational evangelists. You know, when we get to know someone and we build a relationship and then we begin to share our faith. Well, another part of that is revival. Obviously, revival changes a lot of things. Uh, you know, Nancy had shared her dream, I think the last Bibles and Brunch we had. Uh, and so it, it got me to, uh, to thinking and, and praying and I want to start with Matthew 28, most, one of the most familiar voices we have about the Great Commission. And it's in Matthew 28. And uh, we're going to look at verses 18 through 20. And most of you probably, could, probably will quote this. But it says that Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded. And surely I am with you always till the very end of the age. So it makes a distinction there. It says go make disciples, not converts. And... During a time of a move of the Spirit, of revival, it's, it's like a fishing analogy, is that the fish jump into the boat. Uh, evangelism becomes very easy. The hard work is in the discipleship, the cleaning of the fish. And it's a lot of work. And it's very unsettling. And I want to look at one other verse before we go, and that's Luke 14. And it cost. There's a high cost to it. So in Luke 14, I'm going to start with verse 25. Jesus is speaking to his disciples, and he says, A large crowd was traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brother and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now, obviously, he didn't want us to hate our brothers or sisters or wife, but he says in comparison to our love for Christ that nothing would hinder us from our first devotion to the Lord. In verse 27, and anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? For if he lays the foundation and is not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Will he not first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one 
coming against him with 20,000. If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the others are still a long ways off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. So what I want to talk about in this first part is counting the cost. You know, as revival happens, things change and things cannot remain the same. You know, it, it takes us out of our comfort zone. It pushes us. Uh, and, and as humans, we resist change. We're, we're comfortable, usually, and, and when change comes, we, we have a tendency to resist that change. Because it increases our workload. And if you think about it, with a, a flood of people coming in here who don't know John 6, you know, 3.16, don't know anything, that's a lot of work. It takes a lot of work. It takes making those disciples. And some of them may not be the most, uh, how should I say, people you would not normally associate with look a lot different than you do, talk a lot different than you do, and yet we have to have open arms and embrace those that are coming in. If you go back to the, the Jesus movement, you know, in the late 60s, early 70s, what happened was when a lot of these hippies were getting saved and coming to the kingdom of God, a lot of the churches was like, no, you know, you don't smell good. You got long hair, you know, you're wearing sandals and all the, you know. And so they did, were not accepted in many cases. The churches that did grew and flourished, multiplied. And with that, talking about the cost, our, our time has to be reprioritized. Uh, you know, time... Time is life. You know, two of the big commandments we have, we think about our finances, but really, time is life. What do we do with our time? You know, there, there, there may be things we have to give up, not evil things, not bad things. I mean, maybe our normal rec recreation activities, it may be vacations, it may be what we normally do that we have to sacrifice in order to host a move of the Spirit, because it is a lot of work, and it requires everyone to be involved. And we can't use and even say, well, you know, I did my share, I'm older now. We need everybody, everybody to be doing their part in bringing and hosting a move of the Holy Spirit. You know, David, uh, you don't need to turn there, but Second Samuel 24, 24 he said, I will not sacrifice to the Lord, my God, burnt offerings that cost me nothing. That's what a sacrifice is about. Sacrifice means it's costing you something. Romans 12.1 says, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. So we are to offer our bodies as living sacrifices. <laughs> Proverbs 14.4 says, When there are no oxen in the manger, the manger is clean. But from the strength of the ox comes an abundant harvest. And remember, I used that verse when we first started our, our whole team ministry concept. I said, you know, it, it's going to be messy. There's going to be times when it's a mess. But it's worth it because much is accomplished through it. And especially when you're changing the paradigm of how church happens. So we come to this point and we get excited about hearing what's going to happen. Revival breaking forth. You know, a roof being blown off. Church fire of God coming down. And we want that. We love that. But at the same time, we got to say, okay... Church on the Rock, Harrisonville, are we ready to count the cost? Are we ready to do what it 
needs to be done to host those who are going to be coming in. And so that's my question to you this morning. Just, are you willing? You know, what I'm holding on to, there's a verse, uh, Psalms 110, verse 3. It says, your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power. So that's what I'm confessing. That's what I'm praying, that God's people will offer themselves freely on the day of his power. So when this begins to happen, that we are ready, we've already set our minds, we are all ready to move along with what the Spirit's calling us to do, and we're willing to realize that things are going to change, or lives are going to be different. And we have to admit, you know, sometimes we get comfortable. Sometimes it's just comfortable to just have this group in here. We know each other. We have fun. We love each other. And that can upset that whole apple cart. But we have to be willing to say, yes, we'll do what it takes. So I would ask in these next few, as we begin to pray about this move, it is coming to position ourselves to receive what the Lord wants us to do and prepare ourselves to give all that we are for his kingdom and his. And so that's part of the making him known part. So I'm kind of doing a little of a two-part, and the second part is going to be knowing God and how we, we grow as individuals, how we work, up our, you know, work out our salvation with fear and trembling. So at the same time, you know, we're ministering to others, we always have to keep our intimacy with the Lord first. You know, Scott talked about last week that verse about where the Lord said, I never knew you. And that's, that speaks of an intimacy. We never, you never really knew the Lord. And so it's our, we have to steward our own lives. We have to steward our own guards. We have to pull the weeds out of our garden. We have to prepare ourselves to, at the same time that we're ministering to others, that we're growing in the things of the Lord. So what I want us to do, we're going to go to the book of Philippians, and we're going to kind of do a quick survey through it. Now, the Philippian, the Philippian church was, uh, was actually the, the first church that was founded by Paul in Europe. And if you remember from the book of Acts, the first convert was Lydia, a woman who was a seller of purple goods. So it started with one person, one woman. And as Paul is writing this letter to them, it's, it's around 62 A.D. Now, Paul was in Rome. He was a, a prisoner. He was in chains. And he's writing this letter, and they believe... They don't know the exact date, but believe that Paul was martyred between 64 and 67 A.D. So about you know, three or four years after this letter was written, he was martyred, he was executed. And I want to say as we begin to look at this, remember that Paul told Timothy, give attention to the public reading of Scripture. And also the Word says that the Word of God never returns void. So as we begin to read through Philippians, instead of thinking of the Philippian church, let's think of Church on the Rock, Harrisonville. Let's put ourselves in this story. So Lord, I just ask even now as we open your word, Lord, your word is precious. I ask the Lord that you would bless the reading of your word. Lord, that you'd give us insight. And Lord, that each part that speaks one uh, to one person, and another part speaks to another person, Lord, that your word was not return void. And Lord, that you would speak to us as a congregation. And Lord, help us to grow in that intimacy with you, that we would truly know you, and we would make you known. So Lord, we thank you for your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we're just going to start going through. Start in verse 1, chapter 1. It says, Paul and Timothy, a servant of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi. So we're going to just put in Church on the Rock, Harrisonville, together, 
with the overseers and the deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you in all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. That's another confident thing you can take. That he who began the good work in you, he will carry it on to completion. Now it is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart. For whether I am in chains, are defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with all the affliction, all the affection, sorry, of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may bound more and more in knowledge and depth and of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Verse 12. Now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. Now, it is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so in love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am going on to live in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. So that through my being with you again, your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of of me. Verse 27, whatever happens, conduct yourself as a man, in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come to see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. 
For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him. Since you are going through the same struggles you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. So many times we don't think about that, that we've been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe, but also at times to suffer for him. Chapter 2. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourself. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. You know, that the selfishness, we, we come about that pretty naturally, don't we? That just comes natural. Verse 5, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. And this next several verses is, was a hymn that they would, would sing and they would also uh, speak to each other. Who being in very nature, God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. But he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of his servant being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest places and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life in order that I may boast on that day of Christ that I did not run or labor for nothing. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Now, 19 for the rest of the chapter is is more of a personal, he's talking about Timothy and Epaphroditus, but we're going to go ahead and go down to chapter 3. And it says, Finally, brothers, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same thing to you, and it is a safeguard for you. Now watch out for the dogs, those men who do evil, those mutilators of the flesh, for it is we who are the circumcision, we who worship in the Spirit of God, who glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for such confidence, if anyone else thinks he has reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. I was circumcised on the eighth day, the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrew, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. 
What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having the righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. In his suffering, becoming like him in death, and so somehow to gain the resurrection from the dead. And it's not that I have already obtained this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining forward towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenly in Christ Jesus. All of us who are mature should take a view of things, such a view of things. And if at some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Join with me in following my example, brothers, and take note of those who live according to the pattern we gave you. For as I have often told you before, and now say again even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is their shame. Their minds are on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly wait a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly lives so that they will be like his glorious body. Chapter 4. Therefore, my brothers, with whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, that is how you should stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. Now I plead with Eudia and I plead with Cynthia to agree with each other in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, loyal, loyal yoke fellow, help these women who have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of the fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. That's a pretty high uh, standard, hmm? Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So again, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer, petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the promise that, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. That's speaking about the battleground of the mind. We all have thoughts. We all have attacks that come against us. 
and we need to begin to train our minds. And that's what we are to think about. Things that are noble, what is right, what is pure, what is lovely, what is admirable. Think about such things. And whatever you have learned or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. Verse 10, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. You want to know the secret of how to be content, no matter what circumstances are? Whether the money's good, whether the money's bad, Things are going good, relationships are good, relationships are bad. Verse 12, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Verse 13, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. We can do everything through him who gives us strength. Yet it was good for you to share my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippines know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out for Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you alone. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid again and again when I was in need. Not that I'm looking for a gift, but I'm looking for what may be credited to your account. I have received full payment and even more. I am amply supplied. Now I have received from Papyritus the gift you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Greet all the saints in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me send greetings. All the saints send you greetings especially those belonging to Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. So even though Paul was a prisoner in Rome, he actually was able to witness to the palace guard, to even into the highest ranks of the empire. And people even in Caesar's household were saved and came to know the Lord. So even though he was in chains, you know, the gospel, as he says, you know, the gospel was not changed. So the word of God, you know, it's powerful. I mean, there's something in that, in those four chapters for all of us. And that's why we need to continue to feed our minds and our hearts. And if you don't have a a regular Bible reading plan, you need to have that. You need to have a systematic way where you're going through the Word of God over and over again. And again, some type of reading plan where you're systematically going through it so you're you're receiving it. Because there's many times when you may say, well, I've read that before, and then all of a sudden it's like a light comes on and the Lord just begins to show you something that you've you've read a hundred times before, but all of a sudden there's revelation on it. And it, and it applies to you, and it changes you. So his word is so precious. We need to continue to be in it. We need to take time to read it. There's the blessing that comes with a, with a reading of the word. And again, as we apply it to our hearts, things change. And so we need to continue to grow ourselves, with that part about, again, knowing God, developing our relationship with him, And another part of that relationship is through prayer. It's through pouring out your heart. And you know, when you pray, you don't need to pray in King James. You know, just 
pray what's in your heart. I mean, he knows what, what's going on. He knows what's going on within you, so it's not like he's going to be embarrassed. You just share what's going on with your, your heart. You get, you get to the depth of the issues, and you just cry out. And sometimes it's just crying to the Lord, help. Lord, I need help. And he's there. And as we begin to do that, that dialogue begins to grow. And as that begins to grow, then you begin to get impressions. And the Lord begins to speak to you. And he begins to give you little impressions about this or that. Or go here, do that. Speak to that person. Give you insight that you've never seen before. But it takes time. It's a relationship. It's like a marriage. You have, to, you have to put the time in. You have to put the effort in to truly know the Lord and, know what his, and to be in his word so you know what his attributes are, what pleases him, what displeases him. And as you develop in that, then you'll find the road gets a little narrow and narrow and things that the Lord used to let you kind of get away with was no big deal. All of a sudden, he puts his finger on those little things your attitudes. Didn't we read something about grumbling in there? Do all things without grumbling? Yeah. But little things like that that we could say, well, that's no big deal. But then the Lord begins to ah, tap you on the shoulder and go, mm, maybe you need to change that a little bit. And so as we begin to grow and begin to hear the voice of the Lord, as we study his word, as we begin to develop that relationship, that intimacy within us, then we begin to change from the inside out. And the glory of the Lord is so awesome. And that relationship is so awesome. That he said he'd never leave us. He would never forsake us. And as we begin to get real busy, as we begin to move and host a move of the Holy Spirit, we can't let the other part of it other part of our intimacy with the Lord and development of our own knowing God flip. And so it does. It takes more time. It takes more effort. It's going to take more everything. But it's worth it. You know, it said something in there, didn't it? We're, you know, we're not citizens here. Our citizenship is in heaven. Now, we say that, but I don't think we really grasp it. In fact, remember when Paul said in there, he said, I don't know what to do. He said, it would be much better for me to go, to die. Much better to be a Christ than to be here. Now, we read that, but I don't know if we really know that. You know, we, we have head knowledge of it, but it, many times it hasn't sunk into our heart. But there's a reality that he wants us to experience and to truly know. And so, again, I'm, I'm asking that question. For this church body, are we willing to count the cost and host a move of the Spirit? Because it does change everything. And it is messy, but it's worth it. And I think if we get our priorities right and really realize the kingdom of God and the lives that are going to be changed, it's worth the price. So let's stand. Lord, we, we just thank you for your word. Lord, that your word does not return void. And Lord, as we are entering into this time, Lord, a time where the, the darkness is growing darker, but the light is going to be growing lighter. Help us and teach us how to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. How to grow closer to you. How to hear your voice. How to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Make us sensitive, Lord, to, the, to that slightest voice as you speak, Lord. We want to hear your voice. We want to be obedient. Our heart's desire is for you, Lord. We want you. We desire more of you, Lord. And Lord, I ask, Lord, that you would begin to distribute those gifts of the Holy Spirit. Lord, that as those that are coming in 
are going to need help. Lord, we ask for those prophetic words that unlock the heart. Lord, we ask, Lord, for that gift of faith and the working of miracles. Lord, we ask for words of wisdom, words of knowledge. We ask for those gifts of healing, that gift of discernment, of tongues and interpretation. Lord, that we would flow in all of your gifts. And most of all, we invite you, Holy Spirit. We say, come, Holy Spirit. We desire you. We desire your move within us. And Lord, we do want to rejoice that all through this letter, as Paul said, again, I say rejoice in the Lord. We rejoice in your goodness, your kindness to us, your blessings in our life, your faithfulness to us, Lord. You have been so good. So good. You are so worthy of all our praise and our adoration, Lord. And so, Lord, we do want to offer our lives as a living sacrifice to present it before you for your purposes and your kingdom. So, Lord, we thank you. And, Lord, I ask even now, Lord, that you would stretch forth your hand. And, Lord, anyone who has a sickness, a disease, an infirmity, Lord, you are the healer. You are the great physician. There's no disease that will stand before your people, Lord. And so, Lord, we're asking you for a demonstration of that in our midst this morning. Lord, do what you do. Light fires within the heart. Lord, just as you've touched in Azrael, Lord, we ask that you would touch each one in here, Lord. That you would do a work. Let that fire flame it. Lord, blow it. Blow on it, Lord. Cause it to become a raging fire, Lord, that consumes us. And Lord, that that fire would consume the dross within our lives, Lord, and make us those vessels of honor and vessels of use. So, Lord, we praise you this morning. We give you the glory in Jesus' name.